Can any one test do justice to a year like 2013? I mean, what a year. Incredible cars, some amazing locations to test them, and here in the UK, we've even seen a long, dry summer. That's a big deal to us, I can assure you. To say we've all been looking forward to this year's Evo Car of the Year is a massive understatement. We've been talking about it and planning it for months. So here it is, the most thrilling cars we've driven in one place for a full week of pure hooning. Sorry, um, I mean professional assessment. We've got eight contenders from a rabid hot hatch to the hardest of hardcore supercars. Inline fours, flat sixes, V8s, V10s and V12s, every base is covered. First up, the Aston Martin V12 Vantage S, probably the best Aston road car of all time. It's here because we love the concept of a socking great V12 in a tiny car and because it was simply brilliant on the roads of California where it was launched. We've only driven our next contender, the SLS AMG Black Series, on track thus far. But despite eating pilot cups for breakfast, lunch and dinner, the sheer grunt, control and surprising finesse of this thing meant it just had to be here. The svelte Audi R8 might look familiar these days, but we found a new edge married to the same sublime balance Audi supercar has always demonstrated in the fabulous V10 Plus model. It's the best R8 ever, the best Audi ever by a country mile and a serious contender. Porsche's new GT3 might have ditched the manual gearbox, it might not feature the famed old Metzger engine and it might have, of all things, electric power steering. But no car of the year competition would be complete without it. Too clinical, too fast or just a massive evolutionary leap forwards? These roads will answer those questions absolutely definitively. Maybe the other Porsche, the Cayman S, here complete with an old-fashioned and wonderful manual gearbox and genuinely usable performance, will prove to be a more engaging, accessible driver's car. Then again, a 730 horsepower V12 engine Ferrari might just overwhelm everything. The F12 is simply a ferocious machine with a mixture of precision and lariness that has to be experienced to be believed. Will it win? More importantly, will its rear tyres last more than the first morning? We certainly hope so. The Mini John Cooper Works GP couldn't be more different to the F12, but it shares the Ferrari's intensity, and although you might scoff at the idea of a front drive hatch taking the fight to the supercars, you'd be wise not to underestimate this amazing little car. It is spectacularly good fun and seriously fast. Finally, we come to the Alpha 4C which seems to combine supercar looks and carbon fibre construction with a lotus-like commitment to lightweight and driving purity. All for a relatively affordable price too. Despite a very brief first encounter with the 4C, we wanted it here badly and were delighted when Alpha delivered it. They even thought to bring a spare set of wheels and tyres should we enjoy it just a little bit too much. What a lineup! perhaps the very best we've ever seen. So in this year of all years, there was only one place that seemed like a fitting location for our Car of the Year competition. A little road in the south of France called the N85. You might know it as the Route Napoleon, and however good you've heard it is, well, double that, then turn it up to 11, and you're getting close. There is nowhere else like it. So welcome to the greatest road in the world. Welcome to Evo Car of the Year 2013. So 2013 has been a spectacular year and this test is a fitting celebration of the very best cars that we've driven. Which brings us to this, the Mini Works GP. And the obvious question, what the hell is a front wheel drive hot hatch doing on this test? And how can it compete with the big boys? Well, this car is here on merit because it is the best front wheel drive car we've driven this year by an absolute mile. And despite being in the supercar's backyard on these roads, it is spectacular. It's precise and nimble and just aggressive as well. So we've tried and enjoyed this car already at our Track Car of the Year competition. And on these roads, it shines just as bright. The engine is sweet and revvy. The big six-pot brakes are fantastic and it is so sharp. You might think, that it would really shine on the tighter hairpin roads. 
but actually it comes alive on the faster corners where you can use its neutral to oversteering balance. Through these sweepers, it will live with almost anything. But what we all really love about this car is that it's a real challenge. It's not just quick and easy to drive, easy to keep up with the other more powerful cars. It's genuinely exciting and with the extreme tyres it's on and it's really, really oversteering balance, you have to show it a lot of respect, especially in the wet. But whatever the road and whatever the weather, this thing is such an event. It hasn't felt overshadowed at all. It's quick, nimble, agile, exciting. I just love it. And if this thing is in your mirrors when you're in one of the supercars, it stays there. No matter what you do, it stays there. It's absolutely a contender. To be honest, it doesn't really matter what's in your mirrors when you're driving the SLS Black Series. This car demands all of your attention. It is so wide that initially, it's all you can do to keep it in one lane of the road. Once you get used to the sheer girth of this thing, well, it's a proper weapon. So it's a lighter, stiffer, faster SLS. But to be honest, it feels like a different car. It's so much more composed, so much more agile, so much more feelsome. You're completely connected to this thing. It's absolutely brilliant. Then it's got this monstrous V8, which now revs to 8,000. Just sounds like thunder. Just listen to this thing. It's unbelievable. I think what really sets this apart, though, from the SLS and really elevates it to one of the main contenders for this Evo car of the year is the sense of connection you get with it through the steering, through the seat. It's so in control of everything it does that you can sort of attack it. And often in the SLS, you, you couldn't attack it in the old car. It felt a bit cumbersome, really, but this is just awesome. It's so much fun. You can drive so hard in it. So it's a mad thing, this, this plaque series. But it's exploitable as well. The track is excellent. On these roads, in the wet, is a proper widow maker. You've got to show it so much respect. But in the dry, you can really attack. It's just a huge amount of fun. Like the Mini, it's a real sense of occasion in this car that it's been honed. There's no flab. It's just a ruthlessly focused car. And it's a monster. I don't know, I love it. Absolutely brilliant. So if the Mini has really surprised us by how well it's doing, even in this exalted company, and if the SLS, the transformation into the Black Series, has been something of a surprise as well, there's one car on this test that is absolutely predictable, and that is the Audi R8 V10 Plus. And that's because every time you jump into an Audi R8, you just cannot believe how silky smooth it is and how beautifully developed. So the V10 Plus is the most hardcore R8 since the demise of the short-lived GT, but it's not a car in the GT3 or Black Series mold. In fact, the Plus tag is dead right. It's just an R8 with a bit more aggression, a bit more control, just everything's ramped up a little bit and it's really, really lovely. So it's a more restrained car than something like the GT3 or the F12. It doesn't kick your head in as soon as you get in it. But don't for a second think this thing is boring. It is absolutely stunning to drive and so much fun. So when you drive this V10 Plus, everything feels so creamy. The S-Tronic box is so Superb. It reminds me of the Bugatti Veyron gearbox, actually. So good. The fixed rate dampers deliver a really supple ride 
but also this incredibly smooth, precise control. So basically, the Plus makes everything else feel like it's trying too hard to achieve similar results. It's just so effortless, but really involving and full of feel. It's just the more you drive it, the more it gets under your skin. Now this Plus has got a tiny bit more understeer than other Pluses we've driven, and the steering's a tiny bit gloopier too, which is a shame. But even so, everything else shines so bright. I love it, this is so good. I'd have this car over a Ferrari 458 or a 12C, and I'm not the only one who's said that over the past couple of days. Forget everything you know, about Audis, this V10 Plus is the real deal. <laughs> so after the honey smooth R8, which just is so honed, we come to the Aston Martin V12 Vantage S, which has got a little bit of the R8's polish combined with a nice bit of the SLS Black Series madness. And the result of that is a really, really entertaining. <laughs> Seriously entertaining car. So the main difference between the Vantage S and the old V12 Vantage, a bit more power for the engine, not that it ever felt like it needed any really. And this seven speed sport shift gearbox, automated manual, single clutch, not as sophisticated as the box in the Audi, the Ferrari, or the SLS, but it suits this car's character actually. It's a real mechanical feel to it. And this car is all about the feel. The steering feel is a real standout feature. beyond the limit. Now you can be a hooligan with it, like I was being, but that's not really the point of this car. The point is, all the time, you can feel exactly what the chassis is doing and play with the balance with the steering and the throttle. It's just a really wicked, wicked thing. And for pure entertainment, it's pretty hard to be. Whenever a car should be right up Evo Street is this new Alpha 4C. It's got a carbon fibre chassis, which means it weighs only 900 kilograms, no power steering. Everything about this car is about purity, lightweight. We're really, really pleased that Alpha, a mainstream manufacturer, has decided to build something like that. However, Sadly, there are some big issues with this car. One of which you can hear now, the engine, four cylinder turbocharged motor, is not sweet. It's the opposite of sweet. It sounds bloody awful. This has got the race exhaust, which we would gladly do without, because it is not nice at all. It's just volume. It's no quality, it's just noise. So what about the unassisted steering that should make this small, light car incredibly engaging as well? Well, somehow that doesn't really work either. In fact, in combination with the engine, that's the two biggest problems we have with this car. The weighting is so inconsistent and it doesn't seem to correspond to the grip level. It's not giving you that fine information. It just sort of goes heavy, light, heavy, really heavy. No real pattern to it. It's, it just makes the car hard to read. And of course the great tragedy of this sort of coarse and lumpy engine and the fact that you can't quite tell what the front wheels are doing is that it masks some really brilliant elements of this car. You can feel that the chassis is incredibly light and stiff. The damping is superb. The balance is really good as well. There's just a bit of mild understeer on the road. Not an oversteery car really at road speeds. It just it feels like 
such hard work with that motor and the steering just puts you off because you never know what it's going to do next. So despite all the promise, I'm afraid the 4C falls out of contention first of all. It could be so good, but at the moment it isn't. It isn't as good as it should be. We want to drive this car again when it's finished. At the moment, it doesn't feel it. After the disappointment of the 4C's drivetrain, which is just so frustrating, the Cayman S is like a breath of fresh air. 3.4 litre flat six, absolutely sweet. And it's connected to a six speed manual gearbox. We've got three pedals and a stick that I have to stir around. And it is absolutely brilliant. What this Cayman S lacks in firepower compared to some of the big supercars we've got here, it more than makes up for in poise, agility, and it's just a subtle, supple car. You can just get so much from it. The steering is not as good as Porsches of old, I'm afraid, the electric steering. But even so, because the chassis gives you so much information, you always know where you are with this thing and you can adjust it finely in any way you want. You can play the hooligan, you can keep it neat and tidy. It's just set up really well for people who love driving. So on these fantastic roads, you're not as busy dealing with huge horsepower and steering corrections and wheel spin as you are in some of the big boys. But instead you're focused down on the detail, the tiny little nuances that make this such an engaging driver's car. That's why this car is here. And I think it's going to do pretty well. It's been fascinating to see how it does against the big boys and against its own big brother, the GT3.